Yep, there we go. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, welcome to our last uh, circuit breaker, uh, SG STEM Talk and Trivia. I am Marcus and my co-host is uh, Kanan. Um, Hello everyone. Hi. Uh, today, um, we have uh, Associate Professor Winston Chow to talk more, uh, to tell us about whether climate change um, would change, oh no, whether COVID-19 would change anything about climate change. Uh, but before we begin, as more people are streaming in, we're going to talk about uh, what's going to happen today. So we're going to have a talk for about 10 to 15 minutes, followed by a Q&A or AMA uh, regarding the talk or uh, regarding anything that Winston is, is, is talking about today. Uh, after that, we'll have a trivia, a fundraising trivia, where everyone's encouraged to, to contribute a dollar to the trivia pot. Uh, the instructions are on screen, and uh, the winner of the trivia would decide where, who, which environmental or animal uh, voluntary welfare organization or nonprofit would uh, receive this uh, contribution. So I think we would have all the former winners of the last uh, four trivias with us today. Uh, Nazri, our first winner. Uh, Ivan, our second winner, Jan, our third winner, and last week we had a joint winner. And one more thing to note is that our speaker today, uh, Prof. Uh, Winston Chow, has generously contrib is contributing uh, or topping up $100 to the trivia pot. So uh, whichever uh, charity benefits today, uh, thanks uh, Prof. Chow. My pleasure, my pleasure. It's going to be a fun. Uh, this is on top of uh, whatever else I am going to contribute during the trivia itself. So as I, as I tweeted out, uh, for those of you who came here, you can listen to me talk a bit, but the real fun is with the trivia <laughs> if that happens after that. Okay, so I think it's uh, well, one, one more minute to the start and more people are still streaming in. Some people take a while, I take a while to find the email. Um, so if you have some time now, please head on to tinyurl. Uh, yeah, so the screen, the instructions on how to join the trivia game is on the screen. I would put it into the chat as well. And I also got the uh, slide up for the quiz. So you guys can kind of like eyeball it and see what you want to do. And yes, today's uh, round is going to be WFH for work from home. So you guys, it's up to you guys to guess what WFH stands for. And obviously there'll also be a bonus round from uh, the talk later. So make sure you pay attention. Oh, and also right, for those who are curious, we do not have the bonus question yet. When uh, the presentation is going on, we will just sneak in and type the question out. So yeah. So keep your ears uh, open for during the talk. We yep. already have eight people uh, on the trivia list, and 90% uh, of them have chosen Acres as the beneficiary. We have a new one, Ocean Purpose Project. So there is a question uh, from Sinway. Do we get penalized or wrong spelling? Uh, no, you don't. Unless if it's uh, very far off, you could put your answer in the chat when we go through the answers, maybe. Yeah. So, uh, well, it's 4.06, so we don't wanna, uh, we want to start as close to on time as possible. So uh, get ready. During the talk, uh, well, everyone is muted. That's great. So we don't want any disturbance from, say, uh, uh, an aeroplane or dogs barking. Uh, so please stay muted. We're not uh, going to make sure you are not able to mute yourself. So uh, I will start the introduction. So welcome, everyone, once again to the last uh, circuit breaker session of uh, SG STEM. So this is a chance where uh, we get to hear uh, speakers, pr practitioners, scientists, uh, or educators from the science, technology, engineering, or mathematics fields in Singapore share more about their work. And today we have Associate Professor Winston Chow from the Singapore Management University uh, who will share his insights on the question, does COVID-19 change anything about climate change? Uh, Winston is also the chapter lead author, the only one from Singapore, uh, for the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change for the sixth assessment report to be published uh, in 2021. So without further ado, uh, Winston would share the screen uh, and please. Yes, 
Okay, uh, let me share the right screen first. Okay, you should be able to see this. Uh, firstly, before I be begin, uh, thanks to Kanan and Marcus for actually starting the hashtag SG STEM initiative. It is a fantastic uh, project, not because uh, people have nothing better to do over the circuit breaker period, but because it's time that this sort of uh, initiative can communicate science well to the masses and to you know keep keep each other informed and keep each other in touch of what people are doing here locally in singapore so much applause for that uh also i'm going to keep my talk very short uh i was supposed to deliver this i believe last week but i couldn't because uh, i had another meeting to go for but that was rather serendipitous because over the weekend i think a op-ed of mine got published in channel news asia that actually answers this question so if you want the tldr oh well, this talk will be the tldr version but if you want more material and more meat in that go to channel news asia and then you can read the commentary piece that i wrote uh, but in short, uh, so to answer this question, one way to go about uh, answering it is to go back about two years ago when the IPCC released what I believe is, uh, what I argue is to be the most important of all its documents that have uh, published so far over the past 30 years, the special report on 1.5 degrees C. Why is that so? It's because it gives specific pathways to how humanity can actually get to a point where we can restrict warming to that 1.5 or that two degrees C threshold that uh, 195 nations agreed to in Paris in 2015. Right now, we are at, uh, when this came out, the, there were four main model scenarios or pathways that humanity can go and reach for, but all these four pathways had the same inflection point, the same point where the curve is bent from uh, increasing substantially to decreasing towards ideally a net zero. That means the amount of carbon being emitted into the atmosphere is uh, equal or balanced by the amount uh, that is absorbed at the surface or in the ocean, so on and so forth. Now that inflection point occurs or was supposed to occur in 2020. So in October, when this report, in October 2018, when this report was released, everybody said, okay, this is going to be a problem. We don't see any pot potential pathway in which this inflection point would happen by the year 2020. Uh, well, guess what happened? COVID happened. And uh, when certain agencies, uh, a few, a few uh, NGOs, a few groups looked into uh, the potential decrease uh, in emissions because of the social distancing that has happened uh, and they counted the numbers. The first group that actually did so was the carbon brief people. Uh, they forecasted that a drop of, uh, by the end of this year, uh, there will be a drop of about 3 to 4%, uh, but they didn't have access to more detailed or more granular databases, which the IEA, the International Energy Agency, did. And last month, they, did, they ran the numbers and they projected that even if uh, society worldwide decides to, uh, res you know, to, to resume normalcy or get back to some degree of new normal, we are on course to have a between 5 to 8% drop in global emissions, which uh, translates to about 3 billion tons of CO2. Uh, this is rather unheard of. If you look at the bottom plot, it tells you the annual rate of change you'll see that certain uh, decreases occurred during the Great Depression in the 1930s. A big ass decrease fell in World War II, 1945, and one very small pimple of a decrease happened during the Great Financial Crisis in 2009. Uh, but this year, we are projected to blow that out of the water substantially. So the short answer is uh, COVID and the global social distancing experiment has led to a massive drop in emissions. And I would dare say that uh, the peak that we see on the top plot uh, that, was, uh, that occurred last year will not be repeated uh, because there won't be a new normal. It appears like there won't be a new normal. The final sentence in the slide that experience suggests that a large rebound is likely post-crisis may yet happen. The concern that I wrote in the op-ed is that something similar to uh, 2010, when everybody went full steam ahead uh, and uh, um, you know res uh, resumed the economic activities, may not happen. Hopefully not, because if that happens, then I guess uh, the Paris Agreement uh, thresholds will be very unlikely to be attained. So, if you want something more granular, this paper came out two weeks ago by Corinne de Quer in Nature Climate Change, where they looked at the emissions decrease from January until May this year. 
And we can see uh, on the left plot is by sectors, how much of the reductions by percentage wise of global daily fossil fuel uh, carbon emissions have happened. The biggest chunk isn't from aviation. It isn't from your high flying executives flying from you know, Singapore to Europe or to North America or vice versa. Instead, no, it is the restriction in terms of surface transport of movements along supply chains, of uh, shipping routes that have been curtailed because there is no demand in cities or elsewhere for products that has led to a massive drop. And you can actually discern on the right hand side of the plot where these place, where these uh, emissions have decreased. Uh, we know that China suffered greatly from COVID-19 in the early months of the year, and you can see that mostly uh, that is reflected in the data here. But as the rest of the world practiced social distancing from the beginning of March onwards, you can see then they took the lead. So even with all this, uh, these reductions, uh, and it is anticipated that uh, these emissions will increase somewhat after lockdown ends, there still will be a larger scale 5 to 8% decrease on global emissions this year. So that is, if you want to have a silver lining, a, a piece of good news, this is what happens. COVID, despite all the deaths, all the infections, all the restrictions in economic activity has led to a very noticeable decrease in carbon emissions worldwide that looks likely to stay on for the foreseeable future. The other good benefit, of course, is that uh, you have all the pictures of nature is rebounding. Uh, on the left is a picture taken from uh, Nairobi in Kenya, and that is Mount Kenya in the background there behind that, uh, the, the glass skyscraper that you see. Uh, it's said that nobody has seen that Mount, Mount Kenya from downtown Nairobi uh, since uh, industrialization occurred. The picture on the right is taken from Delhi and that's the Himalayas in the background. Usually Delhi has massive air pollution problems because of the reduction in economic activity. Air quality has improved tremendously worldwide in every major metropolis. That has been a very key benefit of the lockdown. Uh, of course, these are boring pictures. My favorite pictures are from the very interesting memes that have gone around. Uh, you can see that social distancing in Bishan Amokyo Park has been uh, policed by the very dystopian uh, robot dog on the left. But on the right is my favorite picture that Kanan has very kindly sent to me just before the presentation of how nature has really came back and recovered in Bishan Amokyo Park. So should we be happy to note that social distancing is enough to stop climate change? The answer is no, I'm afraid not. The raw fact is that no matter how much emissions we drop uh, this year, we are still on the wrong side of the uh, net zero equation. We are still increasing emissions worldwide. Uh, when I teach climate change uh, previously in NUS and currently in SMU, I use the systems approach talking about stocks and flows. The reduction in emissions this year is a flow, it's a reduction of that rate of increase of uh, carbon emissions. But the stock, the actual size of the carbon in the, uh, in the atmosphere is still bloody large and is still contributing to climate change. How bad is it? The figure on the left is taken by, uh, from a tweet by the director of the Goddard Institute of Space Sciences, uh, Gavin Schmidt. He tweets as climate of Gavin. Uh, every year he has, or every month, he has a plot that shows the prediction of um, whether or not the global mean surface temperature uh, will increase or decrease accordingly. Uh, as of April of this year, he predicts a 70% chance that this year will be the warmest year on record. And given that it's not an El Nino year, it's going to be quite problematic because you don't have that forcing from El Nino that boosts temperatures like what happened in 2016. Now, temperatures are just one thing. We are more interested in my work in the IPCC. We look at the impacts. We look at how vulnerable people are because of the increase in temperature, because of the changes in precipitation, changes in sea level, so on and so forth, that affect people living on the planet. And on the figure on the right, taken from a recent paper from uh, Philip et al., uh, she is uh, part of a group from the Union of Concerned Scientists that published this paper. Uh, they look at what's going to happen you know, over the next year because people stay at home, because people are forced into lockdown. Uh, hospitals are already at full stretch because of COVID. How much additional vulnerability will happen because of those climate impacts that you see in the figure there. 
wildfires. Uh, you have parts of Siberia, which is which are as warm as Singapore right now. Yes, Siberia in May, uh, 30 to 32 degrees Celsius. That's not normal, so to speak. You've got typhoons, you've got hurricanes that will likely affect North, uh, the North Atlantic. You've got one that has already hit uh, the Bay of Bengal with uh, tropical cyclone Ampan, uh, which has caused severe flooding, um, so on and so forth. These sort of things have happened. These sort of things will continue to happen. And let me remind you all, we haven't even reached June yet. We still have half the year to go. So this bad episode of 2020 will persist for the next few months. Okay, so what sort of lessons can we take away from COVID? Uh, the first lesson is that we've all heard personal action is so important. It is critical, you know, we have to watch what we use, we have to reuse, we have to reduce, we have to recycle, we have to make sure that we account for our carbon emissions on a personal level. Guess what? We have been doing so for the past few months through a very inadvertent experiment. It can only go so far. Yeah, you only have reduced carbon emissions by about 7%. It's a lot, but it's still not enough. The main driver, the main change that we can do to make sure that curve drops substantially is to have both governments and corporate uh, businesses, the private sector, they have to change their behavior. They have to help move the needle permanently by reacting to it. And as uh, the, the IPCC Special Report 1.5 has suggested in, in the pages there, uh, there are ways in which climate resilient development pathways, sustainable actions, a, a transition towards uh, an economy where uh, you can make sure people, the inequalities that are present in society worldwide can be accounted for so people can move the needle down permanently while at the same time still develop well. Uh, so nobody will be forced to lose their jobs or livelihoods because of this. The unfortunate thing is that given uh, recent events, you have to only see what's going on in uh, the US, in the UK, in Russia, in Brazil, these four particular nations where the COVID infection rate is through the roof. And you can see how they have also reacted to climate change as well. There are certain similarities in which these governments and these uh, businesses in those areas have uh, reacted to COVID the same way they have been reacting to for climate change over the past 20 to 30 years. The tweet that you see on the right uh, that the New York Times has uh, um, written, somebody in the NYT has written an op-ed, draws these two things together. The similarities are there. So that's a pessimistic note uh, in terms of what climate action can happen after COVID. Well, that, that is not to say that it will happen. I hope it won't happen, uh, but uh, the signs aren't good. Uh, my final slide is more on a personal level. So the previous one looks at the meta-governmental level. Here, we, uh, because the audience is mostly of STEM students, STEM communicators, and my peers, uh, STEM can only go so far. Yes, we need to know the importance of science. Yes, we need to know the importance of physics, of chemistry, or biology, of good, having good mathematical skills, and so on and so forth. But in this day and age, it is not enough. We have to go beyond that. We have to incorporate social sciences. We have to incorporate lessons from history. Uh, we are doomed to repeat ourselves if we don't uh, look into this particular humanities branch. There is a need for interdisciplinary approaches that uh, all, I would argue, all STEM students have to be exposed to. If you are going into grad school, for instance, it's not just enough to be exposed to, to history. It's not just enough to be exposed to economics. I would argue you should talk to fellow grad students from these fields to learn what they're trying to do and then help to develop interesting research that can be applied to answer important questions such as for COVID, such as for climate change. Uh, the second point I want to make is, that's, that's why I thank Marcus and, um, and Kanan repeatedly, communication of STEM is required to a broad audience. It's an important challenge. Uh, I'm not going to give the game away, but next week's speaker has tried to do that, and I think she's doing a very good job. She's in the audience right now. Uh, she knows how difficult it can be to convey the complexities, but also the beauty of what we do in our scientific research to an audience that has a very limited attention span. That is, is difficult, but it can be done and it should be done if you want to make ourselves relevant today, both in terms of COVID and for climate action. Uh, the third is that a knowledge, an interdisciplinary knowledge is also useful when talking to climate and COVID contrarians. You've got a whole bunch of very daft conspiracy theorists out there, very daft people who 
don't listen to reason, don't listen to coherence, don't listen to uh, or misinterpret what consensus is, so on and so forth. We have to be comfortable talking with them, not talking past them, but talking with them and trying to see whether or not you can get them on side. It's a challenge. It's very difficult. Uh, I have in my in my uh, in my classes, I devote one week talking about the importance of communication in climate change. Uh, I'll be happy to answer that if there are questions later on in the Q&A. But the point is, we can't just talk within our own peer group. We can't just talk within our own bubble. We have to go beyond that uh, for good action in not just climate, but COVID. And that's a lesson that we are, we're seeing in real time right now. So that's it. Thank you for listening to me. Again, thanks, Kanan Marcus. Uh, I'll cede the floor back to you guys. Uh, thank you, Winston. That was a really good talk. Um, we have a bunch of questions. Uh, I think we, uh, you, you ready for the questions? Okay, uh, let me just unmute you there. I think. Okay, uh, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so um, first, uh, Greta has a question. Is yeah. it possible to share such things to the citizens in simpler terms so that we can enable them to be aware of biodiversity? <sighs> simpler terms uh what uh, wait what was the question again i, I missed the first part um is it possible to share such things to the citizens in simpler terms so that we can enable them to be aware of biodiversity uh yes you can um this is where the use of analogies is very important it's uh, <laughs> uh i'm the wrong person to ask because the right person to ask is a certain mr Otterman, and he is fantastic in using analogies in trying to tell people linking a story uh to a, a message behind the story to for people to understand um don't forget that humanity is a spot is a storytelling species we learn more from interesting narratives we learn more from interesting stories and they, they, if you can find the right link or the right analogy be it in biodiversity be it in climate change or any other scientific or stem subject uh you get the attention and you help convey that uh, it's one, one analogy I use for climate change is um, the bathtub analogy. Uh, imagine water as CO2 and you are trying to reach a level, you're trying to make sure the level of CO2 doesn't overflow and spills and destroys your toilet. So you have to have a drain there. The problem is that the drain that's leaking out, uh, that, that stores or sequesters the carbon or lets the water drain out is too small and the flow is too little versus the tap that is spewing out all the water, i.e. CO2, into the bathtub. And our challenge is to make sure that at first, the rate has to be balanced, and second, that CO2 store on the bathtub has to be lowered gradually over time. So if you can think of these sort of useful analogies that occur on a day-to-day -day basis with other people, then that's half the battle that's won. Uh, the other half, obviously, is trying to be comfortable conveying that message uh, to the right audience. Okay, that is a really good analogy with the bathtub and stuff. I've never heard that before, but I think it makes total sense. And I think that's that's one way to like put it out to the people. That's nice. Um, next, we have a question from Prema. Um, you mentioned that uh, you mentioned the benefits that climate change has had due to COVID nineteen isolation practices, but have there been any negative impacts? Uh, negative impacts uh, the, on the human side. It's it's a problem. The obvious one is that. If you isolate people, uh, certain jobs are not going to be important anymore. People, I mean, we all know friends, far too many who have lost their jobs uh, because or have their employment restrictions put into place because of uh, the, the, the lockdown impacts. Uh, yes, you save, you save your carbon emissions, but at the cost of not having employment or sustainability in employment for some time. There are other, what, what other negative impacts? Um, on a climate politics side, uh, certain uh, meetings have been postponed. There's a, there was a key meeting that's supposed to be held at the end of this year in Glasgow that has been postponed, in which uh, people, uh, nations are supposed to uh, express their new NDCs, uh, their determined contributions for carbon emissions until the next uh, cycle for five years, and also the global stock take, which is the way that countries actually quantify how much carbon they have or much carbon they will be emitting. So these sort of uh, processes have also been delayed um, because of the practices put into place for people not being uh, able to meet. So th 
those are two that I can come up on the top of my head. If I can think of some more, I'll bring it up as I go along. All right, sure. Thank you. Um, uh, Siva has a question. Are there any indications of a political awakening to the reductions demonstrated by COVID-19? Is it acting as an incentive for achievable outcomes from enhanced measures? Yes, there is. Uh, the political awakening is also tied in with the economic impact. Uh, a couple of months ago, no, it, 2020 has been so long that weeks feel like months. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, the price of oil went crude, dropped to negative territory. That was a big price signal to tell people, Alamak, we have a problem in trying to store oil that we purchased. Uh, and uh, it's a problem. And then people realize, okay, is this going to be quite common because of geopolitical reasons? Yes. Is it because of the, 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 the COVID situation? Yes. But then people realize, hey, oil is going to be a sunset industry. Uh, will this sort of price drops be permanent? Then yes, it is. And because of the big lobby that uh, fossil fuels have in various uh, governments worldwide, then it became a political awakening of sorts. That's when people realize, hey, we can actually use COVID as an opportunity to try and switch the attention from fossil fuels towards renewables. Uh, very, you know, uh, very important point is that over the past year or so, and I think that uh, I just saw this figure that came out this week, the amount of power generated by fossil fuels in the US is now overtaken by power generated by renewable sources, including nuclear, hydro, wind, solar, uh, for the United States for the first time since whenever. So it's the, the political awakening is not just in isolation from COVID or from oil, but it's from the messaging elsewhere, as, uh, elsewhere from people who realize this is a bloody good opportunity to actually get green slash sustainable development into play. So those are the indications that I, I can see and I can interpret. And I am very encouraged by that, uh, especially in the country that, uh, <laughs> you know, in the US where there's a certain election that will take place in November, which hopefully will wake us up from a particular nightmare of inaction on climate and on, and on uh, other particular fronts. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I hope, you know, things change in the US as well. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Gwyneth, <laughs> yeah. Gwyneth wants to know, how do you think the link between climate change and COVID can be communicated such that people and leaders will be motivated to take action? Mm. Uh, I think the link is already there. I think that the motivation is another issue. Uh, the link and the communication is very strong. Uh, if you've been following a lot of uh, discourse, in the news, uh, both in North America and the UK and in Europe, uh, there has been a lot of push by governments there to link the sort of bailouts. Uh, for instance, today in, uh, in, in, I think in France, there's an explicit link that, okay, we're going to bail out airlines. Yes, but you have to keep to uh, green restrictions in emissions. Otherwise, you won't get your money. So that link there, the link is already there. But whether there's the motivation for leaders to follow up on that, that really depends on, that really depends on the country that you have in mind. In some countries that are serious about climate change are also serious about COVID. Uh, I won't mention any countries, you can figure that out yourselves. But those countries that aren't, aren't serious in dealing with COVID, uh, surprisingly enough, uh, they also aren't that serious about dealing with climate change. I, th I think it's probably a running trend to like deny stuff. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. If you were to do a Venn diagram of countries that are serious about climate and countries that are serious about COVID, the overlaps might be, might be quite surprising or unsurprising if you if you talk. Okay, that, that's good to know, I guess. And on the topic of denying, we have two questions. So first, oh uh, <laughs> so first Jay wants to know, what is your go-to evidence to try and convince climate change deniers? And Siva wants to know, do we have a problem of climate change denial in any sector in Singapore? Or is it just about our rate of taking action? Uh, okay. Uh, for Jay's question, I can't tell you a go-to evidence because you have to look at where is the denier or contrarian coming from. If the contrarian is someone from the engineering industry, uh, and I've met a few when I was in the US who denied the fact that how can carbon dioxide be a... Uh, be a greenhouse gas. Yes, there are still people who, who think about that. Then you have to figure out what is their hook or what is their, their, their line of thinking that will make sense for them. Um, 
in, in that person's evidence, this guy worked for uh, Paveway. Paveway is a country that develops infrared missiles. And I said, okay, how do you compute the accuracy for your missiles? They say, oh, we account for it through you know, this infrared beam from a person on the ground aiming at the, at the bomb, and then the bomb picks up that and say, okay, so that transmissivity, how do you account for that in the atmosphere? Oh, we account for all the gases there. And say, then others said, okay, what about CO2? Then he said, yes, we also account for that. Then suddenly you can see the penny drop in his head. Like, okay, how can I actually know that the, the, the transmissivity rate of the atmosphere with CO2's impact without accounting for it, uh, trapping the long wave radiation. Then you can see that, oh, I caught him in a bind where he knows that I'm right, but somehow there's some philosophical or psychological factor that prevents him from accepting the fact that CO2 traps long wave radiation and is a greenhouse gas. Otherwise, it affects the accuracy of the bomb. Uh, so my point is that it's, there is no, if you were to approach this person with another, like, oh, I know CO2 is a greenhouse gas because uh, John Tyndall and Eunice Foote found that out in the 1800s. So that's my go-to evidence. He can say, no, no, I work with CO2 gases. I know what it means. I can do this and do that. But uh, after years of banging my head against the wall, talking to these sort of people, I realized that if you follow, the, if, you're, if you're comfortable knowing what they, what they do for a living and what they work on, there are ways in which you can tweak your evidence or tweak your arguments so that they can see things from your point of view that they are comfortable, but whether or not, and this depends on the person, uh, whether or not they want to take that step towards accepting the evidence, I can't help you with that. That's a, that's a question for psychologists and it goes back to the interdisciplinary uh, research that you need to talk to psychologists to see what actually triggers people to change their minds. Uh, okay, so that's for Jay's. Uh, Siva's question is, do we have a problem? Um, yeah, do we have a problem of climate change denial in any sector in Singapore? Or is it uh, just our rate of taking action? <laughs> and uh, Rania has got a similar question as well. Has Singapore been doing enough and with enough transparency and uh, sh towards shifting the mindsets of both the public and private sector towards sustainable development and action towards climate change? Also, what effect does the COVID pandemic have? on this local mindset. Well, I like how all the questions are just like ending up all and linking to each other. <laughs> okay, um, whether or not Singapore is, there's a climate denial problem, there's a bunch of, uh, I would say there's a minority of very noisy people who will try to, who, who are contrarians for the sake of contrarian sake. Uh, you go to certain online forums, which I look on, you'll see them exist. And there's, it's very difficult to try and get through to them. Uh, but the important thing is that I don't think they have any impact on, on, on the industrial, on the private sector, and more importantly, on governmental decisions on climate change. Uh, whether or not the, uh, the government is doing enough, to them, they'll say that they are doing more than enough. Uh, they say, you know, we only contribute 0.11% of carbon emissions worldwide. They are right in terms of scope one and scope two. Uh, they are spending $100 billion on... Um, on protection of coastlines, which the PUB will manage. Uh, also spending a lot of money on research, uh, on sea level rise and on other sorts of uh, urban sustainability solutions. So they put their money where their mouth is. Uh, but I can see that honestly, yes, compared to what should be done, compared to the guidelines that uh, the, the paths that the uh, uh, special report or 1.5 has uh, postulated or has written out explicitly in 2018, no country in the world is doing enough honestly. Uh, it is hoped that, and I, I will say, you know, uh, I hope that more action will be taken because our government has a legacy of uh, under-promising and over-delivering. So when, when they consult with uh, experts on what sort of climate action will take place, we always know that they are extremely conservative for various political reasons, which we will find out maybe in July, hint, hint, or maybe in August. Uh, but whether or not they have done enough, I would say they can do more. They can do more. Uh, and relative to other countries, I think they are doing more. And to their credit, they are trying to help other countries as well to do more for climate action. Uh, it's difficult to, to say what, what's enough though, because this is when their 0.11 uh, carbon emission, global emissions come into play. Even if we, stop our emissions, we reach net zero. Let's say by 2030, ideally, I wanted to reach 20, uh, net zero sooner rather than at 2050. We only save at most 65 million tons of carbon dioxide a year. 
uh, Japan in its latest uh, INDC, and uh, if people correct me, if people in the audience might uh, they know this better than I do, please correct me. Even if they uh, subscribe to their lowering of emissions to 2050, uh, they will still likely exceed more than that 65 million that we have. So uh, as I've mentioned to, to Audrey in the past, the CO2 module doesn't give a crap where it comes from in terms of the borders. It's still a CO2 molecule that uh, uh, contributes to the enhanced greenhouse effect that causes climate change. It's an all or nothing thing for, for, for reaching net zero. If one country does its bit, then you've reached the problem of the prisoner's dilemma paradox. Uh, why should other countries free ride on what Singapore does when we only contribute this much when other countries that have either historically contributed more or presently contribute more, i.e. US or China respectively, even if they don't, uh, if they try to reduce it to net zero, uh, but they don't, they will have greater impact on climate change worldwide than we do. Uh, it's a long-winded way of saying that. Uh, it's a long-winded way of saying that uh, nobody knows whether we're doing enough because it's a it's a big unified problem for everybody to get involved in. Mm, I agree on that. Um, so we'll take one last question from my side, and then we'll see what Marcus says. So, uh, how effective do you think is the Green Watch 2020 scorecard for the coming election in SG? So this links back to your previous previous answer of what's going to happen in July. I like so, that question. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I think it's I think it's a very good way that uh, the people who were behind it, um, full disclosure, I think I helped out in uh, reviewing that uh, the Green Watch uh, initiative. It it's a very good start. It's a very good start. It's a very good scoreboard. It does the right things in terms of picking out the important aspects uh, that we should focus on for climate action. Uh, what I what I think can be improved is the final score uh, where they say it was plus 8 out of 90. But uh, I think that certain factors are more important than others. I think potentially there could be double counting in the Green Watch uh, criteria. But that's okay. I mean, it's a, as a first start, it's a fantastic product. Uh, the proof of the pudding, however, is applying that to the other uh, political parties in Singapore. How does the SDP? Uh, score stand up, uh, how does the PAP score stand up, how does the Workers' Party score stand up, uh, and whether the other parties that actually have uh, uh, addressed climate change in their respective manifestos, whether that can be counted. And then the, the potential of the Greenwatch scorecard can then you know, develop and can flourish, and that will be very useful for educating voters uh, for that, you know, event that ostensibly might happen in July or August uh, to make a good decision about, you know, if, if we and I personally place a big premium on how the government decides to act on climate change, uh, that scoreboard will be very useful to this particular end. Okay, fair enough. So let's guess we just got to wait a few more months then and see what happens with it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Oh, I, I, I see Dave uh, has helped me out in terms of the climate side, the, 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 the issues with COVID isolation. Yes, the big companies renegotiating climate taxes as well. There's a lot. The, the impacts of climate is more, I'm afraid, on the political and on the corporate side rather than on the scientific side. So thanks, Dave, for uh, reminding me of that. So that is all the questions from my side. Thank you, Winston. Um, do you have anything, Marcus? Yes, I do. Well, thanks uh, so much, Vincent, for addressing the questions and more. Uh, hopefully, this COVID-19 will be a catalyst to uh, create more change for in terms of climate change. Um, but I've got one last question. Hopefully, you could answer help help answer this in a, a few minutes regarding your research in SMU, and what are the academic programs that um, young people can look forward to if they want to make change or try to solve today's uh, contemporary challenges. Okay, uh, thanks for reminding me of that. Uh, my employer, my new employer, uh, not so new, I've been working there for almost a year. Uh, moving from the primarily research environment from NUS to a uh, very go-getter business environment, SNU has, has really transformed how I think about interdisciplinary research and education. And it's the next step, the corollary is transdisciplinary education, in which how useful will the stuff that students learn, can it be applied to businesses? Uh, can it be applied to, uh, for want of a better word, make money or increase profits for, for corporations? Uh, how SMU is going about doing so is that the business school has uh, 
the business school has started off with the help of uh, funding from DBS to try uh, have a sustainability major. And it's important to know to the students there know that hey, sustainability is not just a CSR thing. It's actually for your benefit, it's actually for your company's benefit because if you take into account all the various things, you actually can uh, make your company much more profitable in the long run. So they get exposed to education uh, beyond just the simple accounting, beyond just the simple economics. They see that there's a need for looking at how. Uh, Oh, we have not accounted for the actual price of our, you know, environmental costs in our, in our accounting, so on and so forth. So that's useful. Uh, in terms of research-wise, we are. Um, I'm not going to give the game away. We're trying to look into some aspects of green financing, or, or, and also in my current work with uh, the Cooling Singapore project looking at what particular uh, design guidelines or transdisciplinary applications of climate research at the urban scale can help uh, reduce the heat island and reduce thermal discomfort in Singapore. Uh, but that's the, that's the research, that's the undergraduate. Uh, I postgraduate side, we're still in the midst of developing that. Don't forget, we're still, we only just turned 20 years old this year and US is 100 and what, 115. So we're trying to, find our own way and we're trying to find a particular niche and the, the, the niche that we have is because we're located in the best part of Singapore. I mean, my, the, I, I teach a climate change class that ends at uh, 10 p.m. at night on Mondays and what do I do after that when COVID is not around? I just go downstairs and head on to uh, Timber for post-lesson adult beverages. Uh, it's, it's a great place and the fact that we are in downtown and the fact that we're close to so many corporate HQs allows us the ability to go and visit and talk about sustainability, talk about climate change, uh, you know, at the drop of a hat. And that's one of the nicer things about working uh, in my current institution. And the students love that as well. So it's a, it's a refreshing change. So sure. Thanks so much, Vincent, for telling us that. Um, so uh, thank you so much, Vincent. I, I'm going to unmute everyone and hope everyone can express your appreciation for Winston as well. So unmute oh. all. <laughs> Thanks for the chat, Wilson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, don't go away, everyone. Um, so we're going to move very quickly to the trivia section of the of SG STEM Talk and Trivia. So if you have to go to your toilet break quickly, go and come back. And uh, Kanan is going to start sharing his screen now. Probably. So I'm going to... Mute everyone, except for the host. All right. All right. So, as everyone gets ready, uh, we can give a briefing about the talk and trivia. But um, also, don't go away too quickly because at the end of today's talk, they're going to announce um, what's going to happen after Circuit Breaker. Uh, who is going to talk, how is it going to be like uh, for SG STEM talk and trivia. And so, uh, I don't want to give the game away now. So, uh, if you haven't contributed to uh, our trivia pod, please uh, consider doing so. There's a PayPal link or uh, you can use PayNow. And all of this money would be uh, donated to uh, the winner's beneficiary for the trivia. So, what are the these? Slide, how are the beneficiaries looking so far? Oh. Uh, there is uh, WSCF, ACUS, Ocean Purpose Project, and Singapore Climate Youth Action. That's appropriate for today's talk. So for uh, those who are joining us for the first time for the SG STEM Trivia, we're going to play four rounds, including a bonus round. And today's team is WFH, which we'll get to. Uh, what does this mean later? Please update the live Google Sheet at tinyurl.com sgstem trivia uh, to key in your team's name as well as um, your selected beneficiary. I'm going to put it in the chat box so that you can type it in as well. Uh, and there is an honor code, no looking up for the, for the answers. You could play as a team with someone else or with other people. Uh, but at the end, we request that you take a photo or uh, type in your answers and email it, it to us and that's how we verify that it's correct because there is a donation uh, involved in this. Um, so 
if you have a piece of paper or you have your word processing uh, document open by the sideline, we are ready to begin, uh, Game Master. Yes, we are. Let's go. So um, we will try to go through this quite quickly without me giving you too many um, fun facts because we let's not drag it too long. So W for water. So let's go. Question one for water. How much of the world's water in percentage is suitable for human use? How much of the world's water in percentage is suitable for human use? I'd like to have the, the window open on the side so I can see people's reactions, at least like the first five people's reactions when they're doing this. Okay, uh, and uh, let's move on. Two thirds of Singapore's land area functions as a water catchment for reservoirs. How many reservoirs are there in Singapore? How many reservoirs are there in Singapore? Social studies question. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you guys a, a small clue, right? Out of the total number, all of them have the uh, suffix reservoir, if you call it a suffix. Only one of them has the suffix lake. So I don't know if it's going to help you, but yeah. There are X number of reservoirs and one lake, but they're all considered reservoirs. And for what I learned in social studies, uh, maybe like 20 years ago, it's done to it's obsolete already. So you have to update yourself. <laughs> Let's moving on. Sound travels more efficiently in water compared to air. What is the speed of sound in water? What is the speed of sound in water? A, 340 meters per second. B, 660 meters per second. C, 980 meters per second. D, 480 meters per second. You know what? Um, yeah. I think the last one is it. Yeah, I think yeah, I think there is a typo as well. Uh, if you guys will excuse me, I'm gonna quickly just uh, change stuff because there is a typo. Because we didn't want the uh, the options to be so close to each other. There we go. That's better. Uh, where are we? There we are. It was supposed to be uh, 100 and, uh, 1,480 meters per second. Of course, we like to give a wide range and make you guys choose and be really mean to y'all. So yeah, 340, 660, 980, 140. Four, the largest body of fresh water by volume in the world has its own species of endemic seals. What is the name of this water body? For clues, I've included the uh, the shape of the water body and also a picture of a cute baby seal. All right, moving on to question five. If anyone needs me to go back to questions or repeat something, just shout in the uh, chat. Question five, there are a few sources of fresh water on the planet. Which one is the largest? Which is the largest source of fresh water on the planet? A, groundwater, B, water bodies, like physical water bodies, like rivers, lakes, streams. C, atmospheric water, and D, glaciers and ice caps. Which is the largest source of fresh water on the planet? Gretel wants to know if it's a real photo of a seal. It is a real photo of a seal. I know they look adorable, but that's that's not a toy. It's a real seal pup. And for F, for WFH, it's fantasy. So moving on to part two, fantasy. It's probably not what any of you think it is, right? Yo. Name the multi-headed dog that guards the gates of the underworld in Greek mythology. This fantasy creature also appears in the Harry Potter series of books and movies too, I think. So what is the name of this three-headed dog? 
I, I feel like Winston almost knows this, almost. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Right, what's the name of the three headed dog in Greek mythology? And two, talking trees are a prominent feature in the fantasy and folklore around the world. What is the race of the tree like beings in J.R.R. Tolkien's fantasy world of Middle Earth? I know it's not Groot, it is not Groot. <laughs> Sinway is like, I thought this is SG stem. Sinway, the M in stem stands for mythology now. So, yeah. <laughs> this is the diversification part. Yeah, it is. All right, moving on. On the note of fantasy trees, this is all the botanists out there, even though it's not real. What is this violent tree that is featured in the Harry Potter series? What is the name of this violent tree featured in the Harry Potter series? By the way, if everyone, uh, if you have noticed, our ambassador for SG STEM is actually a real STEM, if you've seen the posters. So that's our visual pun for you. Uh, SG STEM's uh, ambassador is a STEM, a piece of, um, I think it's a Shoria tree from Bukit Timah Nature Reserve. So that's how we've got trees. I think, I think calling it a stem is a bit of a push. <laughs> it's a trunk, it's a log. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, our botanist, is saying it's a, a tr tree trunk, it's not a stem. Okay, and uh, this is supposed to be a question. Yep, this is supposed to be a question four, not five. Uh, what species of dragon did the protagonist hiccup tame in How to Train Your Dragon? What species of dragon did your protagonist hiccup tame in How to Train Your Dragon? A, a deadly nether, B, a skrill, C, night terror, and D, night fury. What species of dragon did Hiccup train in How to Train Your Dragon? By the way, right, these are all dragons that appear in the film. So yeah, I, I didn't make up any of these. And for the real question five, because I cannot number, uh, what should you do? No, not what should you do. What should you feed a newly hatched dragon, according to Hagrid? A, veal and venison. B, brandy and chicken blood. C, cow's milk and blood. D, powdered dragon shell. What should you feed a newly hatched dragon, according to Hagrid? People of game and keys at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. A, veal and venison, B, brandy and chicken blood, C, cow's milk and blood, D, powdered dragon shell. So we have some love and hate for this section. Yeah. <laughs> Wait till we get to the next one. Yeah, I think it's going to get worse. Ivan is like, damn, my knowledge of fantasy is better than my knowledge of water. You know what? You and me both. You and me both. This was one of, this was one of those topics that I didn't need to research much. I was like, you know what? Bang, let's go. Right, let's go to H. H for holidays. So this is going to be a bunch of holiday-related questions. KFC is the Christmas tradition in blank, where it is so popular that customers have to place their holiday order two months in advance. Uh, blank is a country. In which country is KFC the Christmas tradition that people have to place their orders two months in advance? I see Winston Dodo pumping his fist either in, in anger or... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In triumph, yeah. <laughs> Gretel wants to know what's my Hogwarts house. I am a Ravenclaw, loud and proud. I also have like a Ravenclaw tie and a lot of Ravenclaw stuff. So yeah, uh, let's go. Question two, if you look out of your window in the heart of winter and you see Marie Louis, the gray mare and her party of revelers, which country are you in? Uh, that picture is Marie Louis. Uh, if you see Marie Louis, the gray mare and a party of revelers, you are, are you in A, Germany, B, Belgium, C, Wales, or D, Vienna? 
In which country are you in? Ooh, Jen Tan's a Ravenclaw too. Woo! Uh, Ivan, question one uh, is this. In which country is KFC the Christmas tradition and it's so popular that people have to place their orders like two months in advance? So so question two is Mari Lewitt. Mari Lewitt is usually a horse, a dressed up horse skull with a pole underneath it and people carry it around. So when you say revelers, they are actual people and they carry it around from like house to house. So which country? Question three for holidays. The Day of the Dead and Cinco de Mayo are the same Mexican holidays. The Day of the Dead and Cinco de Mayo are the same Mexican holidays. True or false? Okay, so let's go to the next one. All right, so there's something closer to home. There is a bunch of answers for this, so go for it. Name one religious observance in Singapore that has lost its public holiday status in 1968 due to the need to compete in the global market following the withdrawal of British colonial troops. Name one religious observance in Singapore that lost, it, that lost its public holiday status in 1968 due to the need to compete in the global market following the withdrawal of British colonial troops. Okay. And the last question for holidays and the pre-bonus round. What does the tradition of Boxing Day have its roots in? Boxing Day comes from A, drunken family brawls, B, gift giving to servants, unboxing of Christmas presents or breaking down the boxes before recycling them, which is really important. Where does the tradition of Boxing Day come from? All right, and that is us. Ooh. And we will go, we'll go to the answers. I'm gonna go through quite quickly because it is reaching five and I do not wanna keep you guys from your Friday revelries. And let's go for answers for water. 0.3% of the world's water is suitable for human use. 0.3% is suitable for human use. That is like having 100 cans of Coke, but you can drink less than half of it. And uh, let's move on. The number of reservoirs in Singapore is 17. The number of reservoirs in Singapore is 17. The one lake is Jurong Lake. Everything else is a reservoir. And many people do not realize that there is a Tekong Reservoir, which is right over here. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but that's Tekong and that's Tekong Reservoir. So we have 16 reservoirs and one lake. Uh, question three. This was why I had to go and change it because I screwed up on the right answer. It's 148 meters per second in water, which is three times as- Four hundred and eighty meters per second. Thank you. One thousand. I told you I cannot numbers, man. Thousand four hundred and eighty meters per second, which is about four point three times faster as it is in air. In air, it's about three hundred and forty-three meters. Question four: Lake Baikal is the largest fresh body, largest body of fresh water, and it has its own species of seals. Lake Baikal seals are the only freshwater pinnipeds, and Lake Baikal is supposedly the deepest, and it's considered to be the oldest lake in the world no 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 no, no not, not quite so there are at least uh, there's another species of freshwater pinnipeds uh, there are two other lakes in russia that has freshwater seals but are they lake baikal seals as well no okay they are I thought species of another kind of seal oh okay I, I think these are the only obligate species i think i'll have to read about that yes. i didn't know that i didn't know that and uh the largest source of fresh water is glaciers and ice caps so you guys will need to fight with polar bears and penguins for your really fresh water. And by the way, all of them, like I said earlier, they're all the fresh water sources and glaciers and ice caps is where most of the water is locked up in. And let's go to fantasy. Cerberus is the three-headed dog that is found in Greek mythology and also in Harry Potter where it was called Fluffy. The talking trees are ants, E-N-T, Ants in uh, the middle herd. 
And the other violent tree is the Whomping Willow found at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Uh, I think we can accept three ends. Marcus? Yep, uh, we did arbitration for the first question. So people have asked, uh, one percent or less than one percent is that okay for the amount of uh, water that humans can use all right if you go less than one percent you can take half a point if you get 0 0.3 percent you can get a full point you know don't say i'm being mean uh hiccup trains the night fury toothless is a night fury dragon so yep and that was question four not question five question four is night fury and question five you have to feed a baby dragon brandy and chicken blood every half an hour. You can feed me veal and venison if you want the questions for next week's quiz earlier. So let's go. And let's go to holidays. In Japan is where KFC is a popular tradition. Uh, this is because when KFC first opened in Japan, they went uh, wild with the promo and they were like, oh, this is how people in America celebrate Christmas and Japanese people are like, okay, let's do this. And now they do this. And you are in Wales, if you look out your window and you see Mary Lewitt and a group of people coming towards you. So this group of people will play, play song and rhyme games with the owners of the pubs and house. And if you lose, Mary Lewitt will come into your cellar and drink all your beer. It's supposed to be good luck for you, even though you don't have any beer left because a host drank it. And false. Cinco de Mayo is, uh, celebrates Mexicans, uh, Mexican army's victory over the French in 1862, while Day of the Dead is praying and remembering those who have died. And uh, it's supposed to be a happy thing because your loved ones awaken and celebrate with you. So false, they are not the same day. And this is the list of uh, religious observances that have lost their public holiday status. Typosome. Maulid, I think that's how it's pronounced. Easter Monday, Boxing Day, second day of Haraya Pasa, and Holy Saturday. This was the list I found. I do not know whether there's any more stuff in the list that I may have left out. So, yeah. Um, request to return to the Harry, the question five of um, fantasy. Question five of fantasy. Uh, brandy and chicken blood. C, brandy and chicken blood. And four is D, Night Fury. Uh, yep, so yeah. Uh, if you say Easter, yeah, I'll give it to you because Easter is always on Sunday, so Easter Monday. Yeah, I'll give you Easter if you say it. And last one, it comes from giving presents to servants because um, on Christmas Day, the servants will have to stay home and, say, and serve their bosses and masters, so they'll uh, miss out on Christmas. So the next day, they, give, they get little Christmas gifts and presents, so it was... Boxing Day, where you give boxes to your servants. So yes, that is us for the actual one. Okay, someone wants to see this again. There we go. It's C, right? Yeah, it's C. C for brandy and chicken blood. I hope you guys really want to know the answer, yeah. and not, not because you got like secret dragons in your house. Oh yeah, let's go. So uh, get on your Oh no, list. no, I, I see you. I, uh, can I uh, stop, pause for a while? I see yeah. what they mean. So if you go back to the question, so slide 15, uh, brandy and chicken blood was actually option B. So if you put option B for question 15, uh, please award yourself the full points. So there was a swap, uh, there was a mismatch in the uh, answer slide. Okay, actually. yes, yes, I did a boo-boo, I apologize. So if you guys put B, you can have it. If you guys put brandy and chicken blood, you can still have it. I'm sorry. I thought you guys were trying to like get recipes on how to keep baby dragons. Okay, so idea. please uh, tally up all your, your score for the different rounds and update the um, STEM spreadsheet uh, before we head on to uh, the bonus round. So the bonus round, is where you can tally and wager your points. And this is where you can keep up, uh, catch up with um, other people who are slightly behind. So how this works is that uh, you can wager from one point to all the points you have uh, currently. And how it works is you gain the number of points of your wager if you are correct for the bonus question. 
But if you are wrong for your bonus question, you lose the number of points you wagered. Right? So this is where stakes are high. Um, and you can either overtake everyone if you get it correct, or you could lose it all. But yep. if the question is difficult, uh, if everyone loses a point, if you wager a little bit, there's a chance that you win. So how difficult will our bonus question be? So we've got three more people to fill up your uh, wager before we yep. move on. And like I always say, wager, what do you got? Do not wager so much more. There are some people in the audience who have wagered 100 points. Oh, I see Marcus's marvelous nails this time. Keeping new normals beyond COVID circuit breaker. Wow. Wait, are these team right. names? Yes, these are team names. They are getting, they are getting creative. They are getting creative. Yes. All, right. all right. So I think all in, let's start. This is our bonus question. How, how much, much is, oh, go for it, Marcus, go for it. How much is global energy related carbon dioxide emissions estimated to fall in 2020? How much is global energy related CO2 emissions estimated to fall in 2020? How are we doing this, Marcus? Do you want to give them a range? Is there any half marks? No range because it was a specific number that was said and on the slide. So we are strict this time. I tried to help you guys. I tried my best to help you guys, but nope. There is no range. You got to bring it down. Yes. Oh, by the way, it's it's, a, it's, a, it's yep. And by the way, it's in it's a percentage, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, it's in a percentage. So don't give us in like uh, tons and stuff like that in percentage. So that should be slightly easy because you got to choose between like zero and a hundred. Yep. It's not too Remember, bad. there's only a minor dip during the the global recession. So this one is so it can't be that much, right? So say. put in all your answers. Uh, we'll let, find let out. Let me know. Yeah, let me know when we can move. Yeah. We give everyone maybe like ten more seconds to think about it. Yeah. Or teams maybe consulting each other. All right. I think we are ready. Yep. Ten seconds up. And the answer is eight percent. Eight percent. All right, so please uh, fill in what is your grand total, considering whether you got it correct or wrong for the wager. Oh, I see a couple of zeros, I'm so sorry. But E and G, oh, some people have got it right. Well done. Ooh, I don't think you can round up. Marcus, can they round up? Audrey wants to know whether they can round up. So I assume you mean round 10%? Is that, is that what she means, 10%? What do you say, Kanan? Hmm. I mean, there was there was a. You know what? You know what? Let's 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 ask. Let's yeah. ask Winston. Let's ask Winston. I guess you can round it up. It's okay. <laughs> so so did they get the full mark then? Yeah. Uh, they can get the full mark. Yes. Okay. And, if, anywhere, if you guys... anywhere from anywhere from just to be simple, anywhere from uh, let's say seven to ten percent is fine. Okay, seven okay, to ten percent. Uh... You you guys you guys can get it, but if you put. 8%, you get that extra one bonus mark that I sometimes give out to people, like the one we, we have for Lalini stock, where if you get the scientific name, so if you get 8%, you get your um, one mark extra, because it can mean everything. So yeah, so this is what you do need to do. Our regulars, you will know this. Update your scores and send us your answers, and um, we will check and re release an official winner much later in the day or tomorrow. But right now, Marcus will give us the unofficial winner soon. Yep, so it seems that our unofficial winner is uh, Sen Shu for now, but we're waiting for three more uh, Prima Sam as well as uh, on a hashtag on assignment to, to fill up your scores. So, well, if they're not filling up their scores, it looks like our unofficial winner is um, Sen Shu, and whose beneficiary is WRSCF. All right, nice. Congratulations. So we will um, check the, uh, our emails for the results and we would update uh, both the final contribution from the trivia pot as well as our uh, official winner on our website.
Thanks so much for playing. So with that, we're going to talk about what's going to happen to us post uh, Circuit Breaker. So we've got a new logo, still the stem or the trunk. Um, and our speakers next week are Mr. Mark Chong, as well as Ms. Audrey Tan uh, from The Straits Times. Mark is a, the executive photojournalist. Well, Audrey is our um, correspondent for science and the environment, who will tell us how a, is a science story told or reported. And for that, we're going to be tracing their footsteps for the El Nino from Indonesia to the Galapagos Islands. And uh, hopefully that will teach us how, if we are from the science, uh, from STEM, how to better communicate with the audience by learning from them. Okay, so this is, uh, they're here with us in this, this week's uh, talk as well. So as so, you guys can see, we have shifted to Thursday uh, at a different timing. So with uh, circuit record ending, uh, and even though it's phase one, some people are going back to work and we are expecting to shift to phase two much sooner than we think. So uh, the new post circuit record timing will be Thursdays, uh, 8 to 9 p.m. But it's not going to be every Thursday. Uh, it will be every other Thursday. So the next session is next Thursday at 4th of on the 4th of June. And the following one will be on the 18th of June. So we are going to make it a later timing on a weekday evening, like you guys asked. And we are going to make it every fortnight, every two weeks. So it's going to be, um, yeah. So just keep a lookout for it. Like, um, I think in the emails that Marcos will send out, you guys know we have a website, we have a Facebook page, uh, and we're also active on Twitter and Facebook and everything. So you guys can find more details there. Yes. Yep. So and we also have our speakers lined up for the next, uh, after, um, Mark's and Audrey's session, we have speakers lined up for the next two other sessions. Uh, already probably talking about disease and someone from, uh, probably from WRS might be talking to us. So that's something to look forward to. Yeah, that's, that's so, the bait right there for you all. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we're going to do the same. We're going to do a Wi-Fi. Uh, so don't go away, turn on your cameras. And yep, I see people putting on the cameras on. Thanks yep. for joining us. You guys know how it works, right? If you've got your animals, you've got cool backgrounds, you know, put them up as well. I remember last week there was a cat. Oh, and there was a dog as well. I see uh, the chicken and uh, Ambu's uh, screen yes, as well. Yes, the chicken is back. All right, so I'm going to take the first uh, gallery page. Yep, so just turn your cameras on. All right, snap, uh, second page. Just to wait for the captions to go away. All right, thanks for joining us. So if you've got any suggestions, feedback, or any topic to suggest for our trivia, uh, do let us know by email or put it in the chat and we'll consider them. Right, so that is us for now. Like I said, we will see you guys again next Thursday at 8 p.m., not Friday, 4 p.m. If you log in here, there'll be no one here. You'll be all alone. So. Um, yeah, uh, let us know if you guys got any questions or any suggestions. And until then, stay home, stay safe, and remember to stay connected with science. Bye-bye.